everybody. Welcome. We are here today with uh, another great panel. Once again, joined by Mr. Kunj Shah. Hey, Kunj, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? And today we have the treat of being joined by Mr. Alan Evans. Uh, you might know Al from Soul Live, Carl Dance's Tiny Universe, and he is the founder of Vintage League Music. Give it up for Alan, everybody. Thank you, Al, for being here. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's, a, it's an honor. Well, we're, we're thrilled to have both of you guys, and um, we got some some great guests we're going to be talking to today about a wide number of subjects and um you know each week we're trying to cover it's it's so hard to cram everything into these episodes there's so much crazy shit going on out there in the world right now and uh i feel like this is a good way to get people as we've said last time we you know facts factual information people who study this who do this for a living gives us a chance to ask questions um, and hopefully all you people out there will, will give it a chance, give it a listen, absorb some new information. And, uh, fun fact, there. my, uh, first concert ever, I think 15 or 16, maybe Irving Plaza was so live. <laughs> first concert ever? <laughs> ever. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't know that. I never knew that, man. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, I used, to, yeah, I, used to, I used to see you guys. Too. I don't know if it was my first concert. I think my first concert was like Aerosmith at Jones Beach or something like that. <laughs> yes. Maybe you know, my 11th concert was Soul Live. <laughs> I mean, I came from a traditional Indian background. So once I didn't really start going to concerts when I was, till I was 14. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, dude. That's crazy. Wow. And today we're going to be talking about some issues of, you know, social justice, police reform, um, talking about the slogan, defund the police, things like that. But, uh, you know, really just issues in general of how people are treated differently and unfairly in this country. And, uh, Al, I know you have some really interesting, um, experience with this growing up from the story about your dad. If you could- so it was just a, a incident back in, in 1958 when my father was playing college football and, um, uh, his team, they 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 were invited to a bowl game down in Florida. What was his name again? Willie Evans was Willie. my father. Yeah, and so there were two you know two um, African American players on the team. My father and another another uh, gentleman, Mike Williams, and um, they they had a, a amazing season. My father was like star running back on the uh, on the squad, and they were invited to a bowl game down in Florida. So. Everything's cool uh, until um, they got word from Florida that uh, they could come down as long as my father and and Mike Williams stayed home in Buffalo because there were, there weren't going to be any you know there weren't going to be any uh, Negroes I guess well we'll go back in time here allowed to play down there so uh, unknowingly to my father the team decided to pass on going down down there so they stuck stuck with my father and the, and the other uh, other player you know and my father actually found out about it like he was just like walking down the street it was like in the newspaper and a neighbor like mentioned it to him he didn't know anything about it you know but anyway so the the, co- the cool thing is is like you know th- this team they they weren't going to go down there without without my father you know like and w- without mike williams i mean they were a team they were a family and the cool thing is is like uh, up until like my father passed away, there was a whole crew of this team. They got together all the time, you know, like, and they, they were like, they were straight up brothers, you know? And so anyway, that's like 1958, you know what I'm saying? And like, my father didn't, you know, the crazy thing as I was, when I was growing up, he didn't make a big deal about it. You know, like I really didn't know much about it until later on. It came to light though, literally 50 years later when the university of buffalo got invited to their first bowl game since then you know and they, it was like and it, it just became a big deal you know because people started digging around in history you know like oh when's the last time they got invited to the ball oh wow this story you know what i mean like so 
it, it made, you know, it was like on ESPN and, you know, Je- you know, Jesse Jackson got involved, you know, like, it was a thing, but the, so Tom bringing it back to basketball though, like this year, you know, I mean, it was just cool to see what, um, it, 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 it hit me especially hard. You know what I mean? It was like, it, it meant a lot to me to see like all, like how the NBA, how one team decided, yo, man, we're not playing this game. You know what I'm saying? And the next thing you know, it just, it was a tidal wave through the entire, all of sports. You know what I'm saying? Like hockey, you know, baseball, tennis. I mean, everybody was just like, yo, all right, we're, we are taking a break here. We are, our voice is going to be heard, you know? So it's just a it's just a, a beautiful thing, you know, like to see like um, people um, standing together for something, you know, like it's it, so it 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 it, uh, it meant a lot to me, you know, and I and I know um, the power of that, you know, personally. I think so, people think that all of this stuff that's happening right now with Colin Kaepernick and the, the NBA that this stuff is new, but it's not new. It's been going on since 1950. The athletes have and musicians, everyone's have had a voice, you know, and maybe that's its own episode. I just think it right now with like finals and stuff happening, it's 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 timely. But damn, it I, I, there's nothing that makes me more angry than the shut up and dribble and shut up and play. You know, like those are the things that I hate the most in the world of you know, just society right now where people are expecting their basketball players to entertain them and their musicians to entertain them, but they're not supposed to be humans. And that was just never something that was accepted or at least not for the 50 year, past 50 years. And people think that everything that's happening now is new. It's not yeah, new. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and like I do, kind of like I mentioned in the other segment about like this, this woman who came on and started giving me shade about uh, me posting about George Floyd. I met there are other people who came who can and I'm actually I'm glad. I'm like, hey man, show your you know, show who you are. Cool. Like I'm not deleting you from any post here, you know. But the thing is it's like people are like some people, and luckily it's chilled out, but some people are like disappointed in me because I was I was using my voice, using my platform as as small as it is, you know what I mean? But still, you know, use my like, oh man, we just want, you know, not, you know, I just want to, hear, I love Soul Live or I love your music and, and that's all it should really be about. No, man, that's not, dude, that's not what I'm, I'm, yeah, I love playing music, but this is life. We're talking about like, yeah. life, you know what I mean? This is, yeah, being a human being, you know what I mean? So like, no, I'm not just going to sit up here and play, play drums for you and be like, everything is cool, you know? Like, no, man, that, that that's, that's not how I roll. That's not, and again, going back to like how I was raised, you know, like knowing where my father came, you know, what he had dealt with, you know what I'm saying? Definitely influenced me, you know what I'm saying? Like, and hopefully like that, that influence will spread, you know, to people who at least want to hear, want to at least try and hear what I have to say. You don't necessarily have to agree, but you don't, don't try and shut me down because of it, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. That's an amazing story. Right on. Thank, you. Thank you for sharing that. All right. We are here with Professor Aya Gruber from University of Colorado Boulder School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us here. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so I got to start off by asking, uh, you have a pretty impressive background. You graduated from UC Berkeley, Harvard Law with honors. You've been a felony trial lawyer and defense lawyer, uh, written two books, um, a law professor for several years now and been featured on tons of television shows, major publications, New York Times. But somewhere in all this, you actually found time to play music as well. Where did that <laughs> fall into the timeline? I just have to ask. I'm so curious. Uh, you know, there were two ways, <laughs> which sounds really funny, <clears throat> maybe three, but, but two ways I was going to go as a kid. And one was music and the other one was law. And I ended up going law, um, I just got interested in human rights and protecting people against detention and things like that. But when I was young, it was all piano, guitar, and singing. Like I was in all the little youth groups and things like that. So since then, I've been in a lot of bands and um, had a lot of different projects from rock to electronic, 
I also did a stint as a singer doing like dance clubhouse music in Miami. Um, yes. and, <laughs> yeah, awesome. I actually, I actually uh, recorded vocals on Cedric Gervais' first album, which never saw the light of day. But, um, and now my husband's actually a musician. He's a bassist mm-hmm. and a producer. And we have a band called Bit Torment that is like 80s goth electronic. <laughs> it has been weird to be a professor and a musician. And then since I had a kid, it's been hard to juggle all three. So probably the music has fallen out a little bit, but <laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> but but I, I still love music. I mean, I still play piano and guitar and drums and sing. And in, a, in another life, I would have done that. You know, I this is going to sound, you know, very weird amongst musicians, but I took this, what was considered the safe route, right? I went to college and law school and easier, much easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, my parents weren't musicians. They weren't, you know, they kind of weren't in that world. They were older. And um, I think if my daughter came and said, I want to be an artist, I would at least tell her before she goes to college, you know, try that for five years, try, you know, at least try it. Because I, I feel like when I look back on it, I feel like I never tried. And it makes me sad. You know? Well, you've done, a lot of, you've done a lot of great things, so I wouldn't be too sad. Okay. All right. So can you tell us a little bit about um, your your book? You know, I mean, when I first looked at the title of it, it seemed like it would be quite controversial. But I've read um, – so the overview, I apologize, I haven't gotten to read the whole thing yet, but, and a lot of reviews and people are saying about it and it seems like really, really well received. Um, and so it seems like you're really onto something here. Can you just tell us a little bit about this sort of different view that you have on the, on the system? And uh, the book, by the way, is called Feminist War on Crime, uh, The Unexpected Role of Women's Liberation and Mass Incarceration. Yeah, I, you know, obviously when you read the title, you could think this is going to be some sort of anti-feminism book, but, you know, I've been a feminist since I was in high school, a protesting, you know, out on the streets, women with a Y feminist. So I really have a lot of sympathies for gender justice and the pursuit of equal rights for women. That's absolutely um, something that I'm very passionate about. However, later in life, I noticed because I, I had wanted to be a public defender forever. My, I talk a little bit about, I'm not even sure I talk about this in the book, um, but my mother was in an internment camp in World War II. Um, she's Japanese. Wow. And so, you know, I had grown up hearing the stories of her entire family. Her father, you know, was forced at gunpoint to do labor there and, and just, you know, the stories of that massive race-based detention. And so I knew, I knew probably from when I was 14, 15, I wanted to be a public defender um, or, or something along that kind of a line. And um, to me, this just seemed fine. You could be a feminist, you could want to be a public defender. That's great. And then sort of as I went through school and got to law school, I found myself in this dilemma where when you study some of the feminist legal theory, it really does send violence against women. So there's this idea that rape and domestic violence are pretty much the main things that are keeping women oppressed. Those are the main markers of women's subordinated status that the criminal law hasn't been tough enough on these things and that therefore feminism means supporting tough criminal law. And I had this dilemma, okay, I want to be a public defender. I want to represent people who do not have the means to hire a private lawyer from this awesome carceral power of the state, right? Like the state has all the resources and they put people in jail and jail, you know, is a horrible place. We're finding that out more and more with the stories of COVID. So I knew I wanted to be that, but at the same time, I was dreading this idea of representing batterers and rapists. Like, how could I ever represent those bad men? We need more jail for them, not less. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of the dilemma that I wrestled with for the last 25 years. And 
Then I started practicing in these specialized domestic violence courts and they're courts that really were pushed by feminists. And they are the courts that take violence against women seriously. And what I found was it was less of a dilemma than I thought. These courts were places where you saw people of color, black and brown men and women in this sort of revolving door of incarceration. So they'd be arrested, put in jail, lose their job, arrested again. You would see women who didn't necessarily want to separate from their partners, um, calling the police for help, but they ended up triggering this penal machine of mandatory arrest, mandatory prosecution, incarceration, that led to these really bad outcomes. They could lose children, they could lose public housing. Immigrant women could find their husbands deported. They could even find themselves deportable. So I realized in the end that this idea of being really tough on men who commit bad acts against women was very appealing as a feminist. Right. Just like the idea of punishing robbers, punishing burglars, right, punishing anybody who commits a crime. It's a very instinctual and appealing sentiment. If they go to jail, they won't do it. Other people won't do it. Life will be great. But the practice of incarcerating people and subjecting them to state violence turned out not to be a solution to anything, and most especially violence against women. It just sort of exacerbated the situation. So, you know, I figured that if I could talk to feminists who were progressives, who believed in Black Lives Matter and gender justice and all of that, and convince them that policing and criminal law was not the solution to inequality, that then they could go out and convince more people. And we could have this consensus that for over a half century, we've looked at these social problems, problems of poverty, despair, discrimination, and we've thrown a lot of masculine and violent policing and imprisonment against it. And it's just really been a huge human rights disaster. So I, I felt like if I can talk to my people and convince them of something that, it, you know, experience had to convince me of that, you know, maybe this would help. So that was kind of like how I came to it. To answer your question, yes, in some circles, it's really controversial. But I think, you know, with the post George Floyd murder protests and Breonna Taylor and all this energy where people are realizing like this policing was supposed to serve and protect. And it's always been about managing the most marginalized people among us and, and putting them in a revolving cycle of jail. It, I think the book has gotten more sympathy than it would have gotten if it had come out in the height of me too, where everybody was really zero tolerance, you know, because of Harvey Weinstein. Right. Right. Do you think that's more of a reflection on the prison system and, and, mass incarceration in general? Yeah, so, you know, I can see these shifts just, you know, having been a law professor now for 18 years or so, I can see these shifts um, in people being more or less receptive to some of the things I've, I'm saying. And one of the big shift was when Michelle Alexander published The New Jim Crow in 2000. 2010. So that book really, um, you know, is, is a many times over bestseller. And one, it was one of the first books to really make it in the mainstream that did a sort of overarching institutional critique of mass incarceration. And she basically traced how imprisoning disproportionately uh, people of color and black men, right? There's a specific anti-black bias here uh, is really just, you can linearly trace how it's an extension of slavery and then Jim Crow and then slave patrols, slave codes, and sort of that being ingrained into the political strategy. And that book opened a lot of people's eyes, right? Mass incarceration isn't just a fact of there just being a ton of criminals in the United States. In fact, our crime rates our property crime rates, for example, are lower per capita than those in Norway. 
right? We, we do, you know, we have sometimes higher violent crimes and definitely more, more gun crime, but not more than a lot of countries. And for 30 years, almost the crime rate has been on a precipitous decline. So, you know, every year you ask people in Gallup polls, is crime increasing? And every year they would say yes, even though it was down. Uh, it really was a case where people's perceptions of who was incarcerated, who was being arrested and why was so far from the reality of the situation. You know, like for policing that 80% of street policing arrests are misdemeanor arrests. That the vast majority of street policing isn't even arresting people, it's just interfacing with people. Right. And that interfacing really moved in the last 20, 30 years to a very disciplinary, you know, show these young men of color who's boss um, type of function. So uh, I think that book was instrumental in sort of opening the mainstream public's eyes. And then since then, we've had a series of events, whether it's been Ferguson and now Floyd, whether it was Eric Garner, where people are really opening their eyes to this reality of mass incarceration and racialized policing. Wow, a lot of, thank you, because a lot of that is pretty eye-opening for me. At the same time, it's re like, after uh, the George Floyd incident, I went on, and I, I, I try to stay away from social media, and especially now, <laughs> like I've, I've kind of checked out, so just for my own sanity, but, I got into a, a discussion with a woman from the UK. Uh, she started quoting all this of uh, George Floyd's rap sheet, you know, and she said, well, it, it would kind of almost threw me over the edge was she said something, well, I, he shouldn't have died, but that's one less criminal on the street. And that was basically what she said. So the, the thing is, I struggle sometimes with people's perceptions of what criminal, who these criminals are, or s supposed criminals, and then how that in obviously that influences their 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 voting of local officials, judges, blah 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 down the line. So I totally dig books like the New Jim Crow and, and protests that have been happening since George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. But I guess what I'm saying is a, a lot of that is, is you're just pre is preaching to the choir and not necessarily changing the hearts and minds of a majority of people who will actually bring change, you know, like, I, I, yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of yeah. one of those one of those things too where for example the title defund the police that that were, there was an opportunity there to talk about you know the issue and that yeah somebody committed crimes that doesn't mean that they're sentenced to death on the street without ever being properly arrested without ever being tried and the idea that there's too much power almost a militaristic style of power and there should be some reorganizing and reevaluating um you know uh but I always feel like defund the police doesn't do justice to what people are actually talking about. I mean, Professor, do you do you ever feel that way about that it scares people off who we need on our side for that change to actually happen? Like we don't want to preach to the choir. We want to get people who are on the fence to see, you know, things the way they really are. Yeah, those are such good questions. You know, I'm just thinking about the woman on social media and I you know, managed to avoid Twitter until about a year ago because it's part of, you know, what we're supposed to do when you promote a book, you're supposed to get on Twitter. And then, you know, now I've been on Twitter for a year and I'm like, oh my God, wait, did the world get more bleak or is it because I'm on Twitter? I think both happened at the same time. Yeah. So it's been, it's been kind of like doom, you know, constant doom scrolling. Um, I, you know, the, the woman who said, wow, George Floyd is a criminal, that's one less criminal. You know, people say stuff like that on Twitter, and then you wonder if if she could look George Floyd's six-year-old little girl who, you know, at the funeral said, Daddy changed the world. Like, could she look that little girl in the eye and say that? Probably not, right? So yeah, I, I think there's a hope. way in which social media dehumanizes the subjects of who we're talking about. I also think that people don't really understand how easy it is to get 
into the criminal justice system, how quickly you can go from misdemeanor to felony for, you know, uh, a marijuana charge, you know, that you can go in for a, a bevy of different things and then you can't pay your bail. And, you know, this it's, it's just a cycle that keeps perpetuating. And all of a sudden you are in this system that's toxic and you're, you have a rap sheet because the system no is broken. Yeah, no options. Oh, absolutely. Like, so for example, uh, young middle-class suburban white kids, they play with toy guns all the time and paint guns and right. they don't get arrested for that. But if you're, you have and a drugs. toy gun, or, or, well, and I drugs. mean, that's not even getting into the actual things we think are illegal conduct, but you know, what are boy, you know, boys being boys in the suburb doing a little bit of, you know, fun graffiti, you know, maybe destroying a little property now and then getting in fights with your friends, right? All the things that we call mischief, Right. If you are privileged, right, or rel even relatively privileged, are the things that land you in that revolving door of jail if you're from a certain neighborhood, right? If you're from a poor minority neighborhood, a heavily policed police neighborhood. So, I mean, Kunja's point that, you know, this divide between, you know, who is and isn't a criminal, it's just, it's not even a... Um, a line that you can draw with any sort of clarity. It's all dependent on race and socioeconomic factors. Um, so, and I would say that, and I have a chapter about this in my book, that this instinct that the woman from England had, which, you know, I would actually characterize as a very American sort of instinct that has been exported uh, by American sort of political speakers and theorists. Um, but that's really an ideology that there are evil criminals and innocent victims. They, you know, one lives in the suburbs, one yeah. is a deviant, you know, or a scary brown man, and we need to declare war on them. That is a set of ideas that was about 20 years in the making, mm -hmm. starting with, uh, Richard Nixon, right, in 68 and going all the way through the Clinton crime bill in 1994. And it was a it was a very specific political move, right, that was very popular, right, be tough on crime, evil criminals, but it was also an economic move. Uh, because one of the things that um, the conservatives wanted to do uh, in the late 70s and, and early 80s, and especially Reagan, was destabilize the welfare state. So this idea that we have too much government, it's providing too much free money to poor people who don't work. That So one of the key narratives to the economic program, like the anti-welfareist, very you know, conservative, small government, individualist, economic program was to say, okay, you got a problem in your neighborhood. That problem is a problem of lazy, poor criminals. Um, it's not a problem of social inequality. So the way to solve problems is criminal law. And here's how we're going to stir up a frenzy over criminal law. We're going to relentlessly publicize white children and women subjected to brutal violence right? And stir up these feelings, these very understandable feelings of disgust and hatred towards criminals. And then we're going to categorize everybody in the system as a horrible criminal. And we're going to like show their mugshots. So this, you know, this didn't come out of the blue. Yeah, I think a big problem is that people, and I don't know if people will have the attention spans to do this at, you know, anymore, but I feel like people just need to be walked through how people are put into the criminal justice system and they go from nonviolent misdemeanor offenders, somebody who didn't even do their homework in juvie and got, you know, and got put into juvie, which is a case that I read about the other day, um, and slowly become more criminalized through the system itself. And I feel like if people were kind of walked through, you know, how somebody become, gets a rap sheet that big, it, it might generate some empathy. I don't know, we're li living in some wild times, so maybe there might not be any empathy at all towards that. But I feel like people just need to see the progression instead of just labeling it black and white, good or bad. And, and that's just what's, what's happening right now. 
Now, I think people are moving. If you look at, you know, what, 2014, when Black Lives Matter first started, um, I would say it was something like 30% of the public thought it was a good thing. And a, a large percentage thought that Black Lives Matter movement was a bad thing. And that shifted to 70% of people supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, I, I have over my career seen a notable shift where I had a point in time where I had a lot of students who were afraid to become public defenders because public defenders represented criminals, you know, and so therefore you were on the side of the criminals and what if they wanted to become a mayor or a judge or something else, you know, you would never become a public defender. Now, most of my students say, you know, should I become a prosecutor? Because prosecutors, aren't they associated with racism? And I don't want to be a prosecutor. So, so the idea that people can't move on this, I, I, I think not only can people move on it, but I think people move really quickly on it after George Floyd, you know, the, the, the woman notwithstanding, there, you know, she may be unmovable. There may be right. nothing you can say to her. And so you just, you just don't, right? Maybe her child will ha have a different point of view. But like sure. defunding the police, I don't know. I'm of two minds about that. Because on the one hand, you could say, wow, it sounds so radical. Like people who say, I'm a Marxist. I'm a socialist. Why do you have to say that? People say, well, right. you, know, you know, AOC, why do you have to say you're a socialist? Just say you're for people having health care. Everybody agrees with that. <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah, exactly. It's really funny. You ask a European, you ask somebody from Germany, like, what do you think of the far left party? you know, the far left of the Democratic Party in the United States. And they say, well, that's pretty much a middle right winger here in Germany. You know, that's, yeah. you know what? what? What do you mean? Like, it's a controversy that people shouldn't die because they don't have health care. That's that's controversial. So, I mean, I hear what you're saying about defund at like if you say defund people think anarchy in the streets like a movie. Um, but in reality, you know, I thought that AOC had a pretty good answer. She said, you know what defunding the police looks like? And if you're thinking about it, if you're white and living in a suburban or exurban middle-class neighborhood, it looks like your neighborhood. Yeah. You get some police every so often. They come, they actually come when you call them for a call, but they're not always there asking you where you're going. Uh, when, you look at, when you look at the litigation that stopped many of the stop and frisk programs in New York City, um, that, you know, we're reaching fever pitch around right. 2013, 2014, uh, or 2011, I think is when they reached the fever pitch around 2011. And then 2013, 14, they started going down and now they're really down 98%. If you look at the way that the police commissioner, Raymond Kelly, justified that stop and frisk program, he didn't say, oh, we're catching tons of criminals because they weren't. Uh, only uh, like 94% of them didn't lead to any form of arrest and 98% of them, there was no weapon found. Um, what he said was, I tell my police to go out there, right? Because we need to show these young black men who's in control on the street. So they know every time when they go out, they think about us, the police. Okay. That's <laughs> the social control that, that was at the heart of that program. A teachable moment, huh? <laughs> well, you mentioned, because you and I have talked before, and you mentioned how when, you know, uh, domestic violence calls answered, then what the children of the house or, you know, whether it's being pulled over in a car or in a home, what they witness from the police is a whole other form of traumatic violence and abuse that they're going to live with for the rest of their lives, you know? The studies show clearly, and they control for race, socioeconomic status, and the whole gamut, that seeing a parent arrested is independent of everything else going in your life, even if you have like otherwise a really traumatic life, is a highly traumatic event for a child that causes a lot of problems in children's lives. Seeing a parent arrested is something that children shouldn't have to go through. And when you think of Jacob Blake's three children who were in the car, what, four, six, and eight, I think, or, or six, eight, and 10, something like that. They were in the car when he was shot. I mean, that is, 
you know, Jacob Blake is not the only casualty of that. Those children are really going to be traumatized by that. And are they in a position to re receive the care they need now? No, right? Nobody's going nobody's to give them care. You know what? Just concentrating on the police killings leaves out are all the other casualties of these kinds of incidents, you know, especially the children. So I don't know, maybe if we did talk more about the children, people would understand that this policing, it's, it's not only ineffective. I mean, just, I, I invite anybody who's watching to go and look up the statistics on how successful stop and frisks are at catching crime. They're so not successful. Um, but, but maybe if you can convince people, they're also really harmful. If you speak to any 13 year old who's been stopped and frisked, that's a traumatic moment. That's a moment that makes them really um, afraid to go out uh, and afraid to access public spaces. So I, I just hope people do, you know, go, go do research on it, you know, the, on the reality of these things. Part of my problem with, with, with answering that with, yeah, you know, no defund or abolish the police, but let's improve the police is we have over 15 years of experience with improving the police, which includes body cams, right. dash cams, anti-implicit bias training, and they've cost millions upon millions of dollars. And they've made some corporations a pretty penny. If you've been the one, you know, manufacturing those body cams, you're like, woohoo, yeah, body cams is a solution. But when it comes down to it, they don't work, right. right? Body cam, one of the reasons body cams don't work is because they don't record the police. <laughs> they record you. <laughs> um, you know, dash cam's a little bit better, but they've just not been shown to control behavior for various reasons. Implicit bias trainings don't work either. Why? Because this isn't a matter of um, being able to control implicit biases. This is a matter of where you deploy mm. lethal force, yeah. right? I think people really have to understand that defund doesn't mean don't give people the security services they need. What it means is there's a rot. There's a rot in this model, Right. Just so, uh, so what I liken it to is, you know, people are saying like the environment and, and California is burning and we need to basically defund the coal industry. Right. Well, that's pretty radical. What's going to happen to all the coal miners? Like that's, you know, if we just turn to clean energy, totally. What's going to happen to coal? What's going to happen to coal miners? Um, I, you know, and I don't think bad things should happen to officers. There definitely should be retraining and programs and they should make a living wage and all those jobs should be preserved. But if you believe that there is a fundamental flaw in this model of providing people security services, just as much as there's a fundamental flaw whole model of providing energy, reforming isn't gonna do much. Like clean coal yeah. is an oxymoron, right? So nonviolent policing may similarly be an oxymoron. So okay. I yeah, so that's where I'm at. Well, thank you so much again. I think we we probably should we could keep going forever, and I hope I hope we get another chance soon. Uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Thank you so much. This was great. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, Clunch, yeah, thank Dave. you. Thanks. I'm so glad you had me. All right. So joining us now is John Monahan, who, uh, Al, I believe you and John might actually know each other. Uh, just, 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 just a little bit, you know, just, you know, a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. We're bro brothers-in-law, brothers-in-law, brother-in-laws. I don't know. I think either might be accepted. We're, we're brothers. <laughs> I hate, I hate the whole in-law thing, man, yeah. to be honest, man. You know, it's like, it's, yeah, we're, we're brothers, you know, <laughs> we're family. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So there you go. And, um, John, we've spoken before, um, you and Al and, and I, uh, but your story is just really incredible. And I thank you so much for joining us here and sharing, uh, being willing to share with us your sure. experience. 
you've been a state trooper, I believe, uh, I recall from our last conversation, as well as chief of police in more than one town in the greater New England area, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. New Hampshire. Yeah. New Hampshire. Okay. And eventually you retired to work at first on criminal justice reform. And then now you work with an organization called All Aces out of Boston. Yeah. Um, All Aces Inc. Yeah. What, what's the website? All Aces Inc. I-N-C. Okay. All Aces Inc. And uh, we'll throw the website up there. And All Aces does work uh, with racial equality, diversity, and inclusion across all spectrums. Um, so first, maybe do you want to start off by telling us about your your experience, uh, how you started out originally as uh, in law enforcement? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a funny story. So I, I moved, I went to forestry school up in northern Vermont and uh, lived in northern New England. I, I'm from Massachusetts. I was born down on the Cape, but I moved up there. I graduated in 89 and I was up there in the 90 and never wanted to go back. I love the woods. I absolutely loved it up there. And, uh, and then at some point I started training in martial arts and I really liked that a lot too. Um, and I just did whatever odd jobs I could do. And, uh, and, and that was super fun for me. And and then I had a kid and I was like, wow, I I have to get a real job. Like, like these things require food and stuff like that and medical insurance. Cause so I, uh, I was looking around, like, what can I do? You know, and, um, up North, you know, there, you could be a logger or a farmer or like maybe work at one of the very few retail or something like that. And, um, I, I also had been training as a healer, actually. I, I, I studied shiatsu. I studied with a, an acupuncturist and um, to balance out the, sort of the healing part of martial arts. And um, so I saw this ad in the paper for Lebanon Police Department. And I was like, wow, I wonder if I could like be calm among, amongst like conflict and, you know, stuff that's scary. Like, can I kind of maintain this martial spirit? And so I, I literally had no desire to be a cop, but just went down and applied. It paid better than I had ever been paid in my life with medical and dental benefits. So I was like, I'm going to try it. Yeah. And, uh, and it stuck and I did it. And, uh, and I ended up going and being a trooper. I covered a really rural area of Northern New Hampshire. Um, it's referred to as patrol five. It had nine towns and only two of them had police departments. So I did all sorts of stuff. So those, those mean guys that pull you over on the side of the highway that I was not that guy. I, uh, I was doing burglaries and rapes and all sorts of crazy stuff in, in way up North breaking up domestics. Um, and, uh, and I really started to see my industry, you know, policing as, as a place that needed change, um, organizationally. So I, I went to school and got a master's degree in organizational leadership and management. Um, and, uh, you know, really in retrospect, I think my frustration with, um, the state police was, was that it does have some elements of oppression within it, you know, and we can talk about it later, but, um, oftentimes when we talk about racism and, and systems of oppression, you know, we think of it as affecting only minorities or, you know, or, or we would call them priority populations or underrepresented people, but it, it really affects everyone just differently and more disproportionately. Um, so, so I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go be the chief of police somewhere. So I, I found this little tiny town in Northern New Hampshire, um, that had had a police shooting like five years before and, and they really were ripped apart. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to put this town back together. I'm going to regain some faith and trust and humanity in this place. And I was bound and determined to do it. So I became the chief in this town called Franconia. Um, it's up in Franconia Notch, if you've ever been up there. And, uh, and that's where I met my wife. And that's how I ended up becoming uh, Alan's brother in law. And um, yeah, and that's where I cut my teeth as far as like, how do you reach into a community and, you know, and, and really be part of its heart and soul. And so that's, and, you know, that's kind of what got me into racial equity work, although New Hampshire's a very white state. Um, 
you know, I, I was super, that's when Black Lives Matter um, and all the, the shootings were coming to light, you know, partially because of the internet and people being able to post it, something that's been happening for a long time. Um, but it, it, but it pulled the, the curtain back and, and I was like, I, I am not going to stand by if my profession's doing this, I'm going to make a difference. And so that's how I got into racial equity work. It's a, a long, a long road into your question, but that's, no, no, it's, that's the, the meat of it. <laughs> I think you actually described that pretty concisely, which must not have been an easy thing to do. I mean, I'm sure you were met with a lot of questions and people not understanding or, even maybe some feelings of betrayal, I don't know, by other, um, you know, law enforcement when you decided to leave or, or, or not so much? Did you not really experience that? Yeah, well, you know, it, I mean, there's people who benefit from those systems. There's people who are in power because of those systems. And when you question it, you question their power. And there's people who get their identity from belonging to those systems. Like, and if that system doesn't exist, where am I? Threat to their own personal identity. So, you know, for me to, to question things it, 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 and say, why are we doing it this way? And oftentimes you hear because we've always done it that way, which is like the worst answer ever. Um, and so, <laughs> and the most common. So I, I uh, you know, I, I, I was well respected because I, I wasn't afraid of stuff. I mean, I was afraid, but I do things that were hard. I was, wasn't afraid to go into dangerous situations. So I kind of like held my own. I had a lot of street credibility. Um, but I also, uh, as far as my philosophy and, and questioning things, you know, that's part of why I wasn't like on the fast track to promotion. Um, you know, because I, 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 well, if you really look into it, I was a critical thinker. And that's part of the problem that we see today is people who are willing to just say, well, why do we do what we do? Why do we believe what we believe? And do I really fit into this, you know, instead of just going upstream with all the other fish, you know, it's important to, to uh, go, go to the beat of your own drum. That's mm -hmm. a metaphor I would like. <laughs> So you went from uh, being the police chief in one town or multiple towns? I, w I was a police chief in Franconia and I didn't finish my story. So I was there for about five and a half years. Um, and, and then I ended up going to a town in the lakes region of New Hampshire called Moultonboro. And I worked there for a couple of years um, before I retired. So I, I got my, the amount of time I had worked and my age, I was old enough to be able to retire. So um, and I, I, during that time I had start, I started to, uh, just at first I just started to educate myself about racism and, and especially it's intersection with law enforcement. And I was fortunate enough to go through a learning cohort. They call it an affinity group. It was for white people to learn about racism because we shouldn't put that burn it on the black or, or um, BIPOC community to expect those folks to educate us. Um, so I went through that, which plugged me into um, the New Hampshire Endowment for Health. And they do a lot of work in, in what's called a race and equity series. And I was uh, part of their uh, criminal justice reform group, work group. Um, and that's that's sort of how I started to to do criminal justice reform work. Um, and then when I was able to retire, I knew that that's what I wanted to do full time. Um, I wanted to do racial equity work and social justice work. I was just going to ask how you got involved with All Aces and if you could tell us a little bit about what All Aces does. Sure. So it's a, another long story. <laughs> so and Kunj, did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I was also kind of just wondering what, you know, if you went to that town to try to heal the town and you found that you were pretty successful in doing so. Yeah. And um, then you went to another town and worked there as well and then eventually retired. Did you find that working from the inside, you know, was there something that made you say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to focus on, like, was there something that happened? Was there just a general thing over time? Was there, you know, what made the, the abrupt change to basically quote unquote, the other side, you know, yeah. but it's not really the other side. It's, we're right. on the same side, but. Right. So I'm going to answer both of your questions. Um, yeah. So Kunj, what, what happened is I had, a, a, as much as I did training in my own department, I had a, a racist incident happen there with, with my only uh, black employee. And I was mortified. I was really upset by it. And, uh, and I worked really hard to fix it. And I worked with him uh, to, to do everything I could to make it right. 
Um, and what I found is that when I was working, I told the town about it. And when I worked with them, uh, uh, the, my message wasn't getting through to the people who were making the decisions about what should happen. I, I, you have a certain amount of authority as a police chief, and then it, it defaults to like select boards or mayors or town uh, managers in certain towns. So uh, as I was piping this information up about this incident I had, um, I, I, it got back to me that it wasn't getting through. And I realized that I was working in a system that wasn't going to support me in doing what was so crucial to, to not just our community, but even within our town politics and our town employment. And um, so, so I was frustrated and I was like, you know, I'm not working for a place that's not going to be uh, aligned with my own morals and values. And so I had had enough time in and so I, I, you know, sort of out of protest, let them know that this is why I was leaving and, um, you know, make sure that employee was taking Cartman is hugely successful there, by the way. Um, or what was that last yeah, one? Yeah, so... He was hugely, he's, he's very successful now where he's moved to. Yeah. So, so that was my, and it was fairly abrupt, you know, I mean, so what I, when I made that decision, um, so, you know, I voted with my feet. Uh, so, so your other question was, how did I come to all aces? And, and so you should know this, here's the little seed I'm going to plant before I tell my story and water it. I grew, I grew up uh, in Attleboro, Mass. And then in high school, I moved to Cape Cod. So I went from this like blue collar Irish Catholic town to a place where the hippies went to retire after the 60s down on the lower Cape. And I had these wonderful teachers who I had never experienced adults like this before. And they were the ones who protested in the 60s. Uh, they got me and a lot of my classmates excited about social justice causes. Back then, it was like apartheid and, and things that were wrong with the world. We had the Cold War still then. And, uh, and we actually hosted uh, some Russian delegates to come talk to us. Like, let's not make them scary monsters, but let's see them as humans. Um, and so, so I had this like social justice seed planted in me. Um, I went through my career. Uh, I was in this town in the lakes region and I was trying to figure out like, how can I bring this town together? They didn't have the same issues that Franconia had, but they were definitely bifurcated in many ways. Uh, I think part of it was geography. Part of it was the disparity in wealth uh, with, with this town. And so, so it's a stupid story in some ways, but I saw online these stickers and they're called, and it just said neighbor. And it was this, this organization called the Nantucket Project. They're, they're based out of Connecticut, but they host this conference on Nantucket every year. And I said, can I get some of these stickers to stick on my cruiser? And uh, because I just wanted people to start seeing us as their neighbor and maybe seeing each other as their neighbor, uh, because I think, if we can see each other as humans and see the humanity in one another, many of these issues we're dealing with will go away. Uh, so, so I got these stickers. Well, little did I know they're also a filmmaking company. And so they were like, Hey, uh, we'll get you the stickers, but we also want to talk to you. So they ended up coming up and, uh, and taking some film and they made a short film about me and, and a couple of uh, folks that I work with. And so there's a small documentary called the box um, by the Nantucket project. And, uh, and I'm in, it's like 10 minutes long. It's not that great. Um, it's amazing. Dude, dude, it's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> so, so, and what we're talking about in the film is like how hard this career can be and how, because of this like macho society we live in and the, ma the macho-ness of the profession that people don't talk about the, da the damage it can do to you, you know? And, uh, and a couple of my friends like opened up and they, they were like, this is, this is the hardship that I faced. And I, I found it really hard to raise my hand and say, I need help knowing I would be ostracized by my peers. And, uh, and sure enough, one of them was. And on the other hand, one wasn't, you know, and his, he had a really hard time, you know, his wife had committed suicide and um, some other stuff to do with his kids and uh, his town and community really embraced him and helped him through that hard time. And the film is really about when we stand up and we're say, Hey, you know what? I'm a little different. I got this thing going on that maybe doesn't fit. Um, are you kicked out or, or are you embraced? And, uh, and so, so that's what the film was all about. Um, so I went to Nantucket. I'm um, talking with this woman named, named Atia Martin, 
who's the co-founder, the founder of, not even co-founder, she's the founder of All Aces Inc. She's the former chief resiliency officer for the city of Boston. And she, uh, and so we're talking about like social justice. I tell her the story about growing up on Cape Cod and Russian delegates and apartheid and, uh, you know, and, and all these things. And, and then they play this film and she didn't know that I was in it. She was like, wait, you're a cop. She's like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, like how can you be all about social justice stuff and be a cop? And so, um, so we talked more, we talked like we're talking now and, um, she basically was like, listen, when you retire, let, let's talk. And so, um, you know, I, I literally up and quit my job. Like, I don't even know what I'm going to go do next. And uh, be, I just felt so strongly about it. And um, and so I talked to her and she was like, I, she's like, I got you, man. I got you. She's like, come work for me. So um, she gave me a home and I very much needed one. And, uh, and I'm so grateful. So what exactly does All Aces do for people who don't really know? Yeah, so we work for like profit, nonprofit, government. And um, the cool thing about it is we do racial equity work, diversity, inclusion, uh, all, you know, all across the board. Um, the thing I like about it the most, you know, because a lot of people talk about like implicit bias and um, you know, that kind of stuff. And we really look at it as like, if you can like develop yourself as a, a person um, and so like you, uh, you, you figure out who you want to be, you have a, a group of people who you're close with that figures out who they want to be and together you can figure out how you want to get there. You start to have like agency and, and you're lurk, learning about and working on racism issues. Um, you can really develop as a human and, um, and you as a group with agency and you as an individual with agency can really make a difference in uh, making sure that we tear down some of these systems of oppression um, and, and you can really make a, a, an impact on the world, you know, instead of just learning all the right words and calling people out. It's really about finding yourself in the conversation of race and racial equity and, and having some like, like some room to move, some skills and tools to get some work done um, and some good people to support you uh, in, in this effort. So, so that's, um, that's like kind of what we do. And so it's more of a process, you know, I, I think racial equity work is a journey. It's not like a HR box that you, you do a, your eight hour workshop, you check the box, everybody's woke now and let's move on. But it's really, it's about um, looking at like, why are things organized the way they're organized? Finding yep. a place in the story. Yeah. Go back to when you were working with the police. Um, did you find, like, what were some of the racial disparities and issues that you saw from the inside because we almost never get an inside view from the actual police of how they saw racial issues you know um firsthand and can you give us some insight on into any of those and, and and maybe some examples of what you any disparities that you saw or or didn't see that that, that people are calling out sure. now i i think one of the hardest parts is that um, how it shows up in police departments varies depending on where you are. Like Southern racism is kind of different than Northern racism. And so, and police departments, I feel like it's like, because we carry weapons and deal with conflict, like it's way more visible than like when it happens at a school or when it happens in housing, when you're trying to, you know, get an apartment or buy a house or when it happens in healthcare, when you're not getting the care that you need, it shows up everywhere. It just shows up really awful and violently on the street uh, in public when it's, it's policing. Um, so so there's that. I'll just say say that in general. That and, and it bothers me when I hear people like cops are racist, you know, because we're we're no more racist than than you know a firefighter or a doctor or a lawyer. Um, however, I will also say this: that um, if you want a brief history lesson, I don't know briefly. So um, <laughs> so so there's a reason like everything is the way it is. Um, and, it, and it starts back in 1619 when the first uh, enslaved people were brought here um, that there's been people making decisions about who gets what that 
and, and they were not the enslaved people, they were not black people that could make those decisions um, that allowed for certain things. And some of the stuff more recently, is like in the early part of the 19th century was in, in the like, especially like in the 40s and 50s, was a thing called redlining. Some of you all probably know about it, right? Who gets to live where? It was written into like the federal you know, laws about who, who gets a mortgage in these neighborhoods and who doesn't. Um, and so that's why we see like inner city neighborhoods that are predominantly black, you know, and then we see white people in the suburbs because the government allowed for that. And so I also believe that uh, because of the disparity, so the civil rights movement did a lot of good. It, it stopped a lot of problems it stopped certain practices, but it didn't fix the damage those practices did. And so even though they said there's no more redlining, well, you still had a really poor neighborhood in the inner city, like because now you can join unions, like unions can't exclude you because of the color of your skin. It didn't change the, the social and economic demographics of that area. And so there was more crime and crime is not a race thing. Crime is like a, usually a poverty uh, thing. There's more crime and poverty because people have a scarcity mindset. And so they make worse decisions and they, you know, harm each other more often. Uh, it's just the, the way it is. So, and I'm not a sociologist, but, um, and so I think what happened is that, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't even call it well-meaning. I'll just say that police executives, who, in my opinion, need a lot more training than they get, uh, were making decisions, policy decisions about how to deal with this, up, you know, this crime. And instead of saying, well, the root of the problem is because of this 400-year history we have of oppression and neglect and abuse, uh, instead of looking at it as perhaps a, a health crisis in many uh, instances, they were like, well, we're just going to start stop uh, questioning and frisking people. And so you had these heavy handed uh, police tactics that were disproportionately used in these communities because that's where the more crime was. Um, and so it it unfairly targeted people of color, right? That's racism. And it was part of a system. So now it's systemic racism. And And I would say that the cops doing it may have started their careers well-meaning and wanting to help people, um, but quickly learned in those systems, if you want to get promoted, you're going to be the guy that makes the most arrests. You're going to be the guy that gets the most drugs, the most guns. Um, you're going to be the guy that, that does. So you're the one who's more heavy handed. You're the one who perhaps start breaking the rules. Um, and you're the one who, you know, and so this system uh, becomes a, a racist system because it disproportionately affects these groups of people. And it's rewarded by the system uh, because those folks get promoted. And quite frankly, those folks end up rising through the ranks and being the ones in charge. Um, and, I, and I don't think they ever question along the way, like, why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we harming these people? And statistically, there's maybe five or 10% of the people that commit crimes in those neighborhoods. And yet, you know, we're, we're blanket, like, like blanket padding and frisking most of these folks, not grandma, not the little kids on their way to school, you know, not the, not all the, the girls, but, uh, and so now you've got this demographic of, of black men, probably, you know, 14 to 40 something who are just being hammered by these people looking for uh, a crime that, 90% of the time isn't there, you know, and so now you've just pissed a lot of people off for decades. <laughs> and then you go and shoot the wrong person and you wonder why there's protests, you know, that's why. That's right, why. right. I just like, so yeah, you're talking about systemic, you know, uh, problems with the, within or uh, throughout. Like how, how does that, and of course you, you're saying people rise to the top who are just like, you know, they're just towing the line. They're just doing the job. They're just, this is, they're just doing the job. They don't ask questions, you know, maybe they know right from wrong, but like, I, I, I always used to think that man with education comes, you know, with knowledge, with education comes a sense of uh, decency, I guess. And not, 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 of course that's a blanket statement, you know, but how does how, like you have being in, in it, and seeing it from the inside, now on the outside, like how literally, man, and not, and then we, we talk about defund the police, and we'll get to it, which is a term that I personally 
I just I I, I don't like. It's, it's just you know it's it's it, and we'll we'll get into that. But how, like, man, seriously, how how can it change? You know what I'm saying? Like, we always talk about, like, man, well, you know, there's not obviously, like, in a lot of communities talking about, you know, you know, stop and frisk and this and that. Most of those most of those cops don't live in those neighborhoods. You know what I'm saying? So they're not invested in in any anybody on the street. You know, like any 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 part of the community. You know, so how like how does that change? And then on top of that. You're, you're, like you said, you stop and frisk a majority of these young black men, for instance, who could possibly be really good recruits for the job. But after a couple of times of that, man, like, why would they want to, you know, go into law enforcement? Like, I, I know a few, I know a few brothers who did, and I'm glad they did. But, yo, know, that is a small number, very small number. And then the amount of BS that they had to deal with once in is it's amazing that they they they're still at it you know Mm -hmm. but anyway i'm sorry i'm I'm, you know it's a lot a lot there but i'm just always curious man just like you know we we talk about the defund the police and all all this kind of stuff when i i don't know if that's really getting to the root of the problem yeah being from where you police is important i think um you know, I've also appreciated living in the next town over at times because for me, at least as a chief, it was nice to have sort of a, a, a mental and emotional break. Um, and because that helped my mental health so I could return refreshed and rejuvenated. Um, so I think looking at our recruit, like who are we getting to come in? You know, are they people with degrees in psychology and sociology, you know, and do they understand how the human mind works, you know, or, and, and like the term defund the police is, so there's certain terms like toxic masculinity, white privilege and defund the police that all land really badly on the very people that need to hear them most. So, and I always say this, I teach some classes and I'm like, those terms are, are horrible, but what they mean is not horrible. So, um, you know, I, I don't know when it happened. I remember being taught about it at the police academy. There's a lawsuit because we used to do what's called warehousing people with mental illness. We would just stick them all in in homes and they they didn't get to live amongst us. And at some point, someone was like a lawyer, of course, uh, or several, was like, you know what? That's not fair. It's an unconstitutional seizure of these people's, you know, freedom. And so they sued and, and sure enough, they won. And, and so they were, you know, if you have mental illness, you are not necessarily, unless you're a threat to yourself or someone else, uh, you can walk amongst us. What they didn't do is fund it. And so there's a lot of untreated mental illness walking around out there. And who do you call when somebody's acting in a way that's not like normal? You call the police and we have poor training And so we deal with it poorly. And so the defund the police is really calling for funding mental health and well-being and substance abuse issues. Um, That's what I was going to say about Al's question about defund the police and the name scaring people off, possibly misrepresenting it is I think people are confused. I mean, if you're on the far, you know, end of no, we need more law and order. It's of course scary to you. And that's a, that's a deal breaker right there. If you're in the middle and you understand that there are things that need to be reformed or, you know, uh, people need to be better qualified to handle different types of situations within the police department, traffic, drug issues, mental illness, domestic violence, they get confused of, well, wait, why would we take money out when really it's going to take an investment to, to specialize and train people? So I think that's where a lot of confusion happens. Yeah. You know, there had been a lot of, it, well, so it depends who you're talking to about it. Like the people who came up with the idea probably understand the depth of it pretty well, but the people who are uh, more militant about it, so, you know, so I always say you can't fight oppression with oppression. And so, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with folks who are early in on their social justice journey. They've got a lot of passion, but maybe not as much knowledge as they should have. And so, uh, so they know the right things to say, but they don't know exactly why they're saying them sometimes. And, uh, and, and so, you know, and you get two people who are in that exact same journey on polar opposite ends. And that's, that's not good. You know, if you're like back the blue and then you're like defund the police, like those two folks probably shouldn't be in the same room together. Um, right. You know, so, so it takes people, 
people who uh, have some depth to be able to really deconstruct and have a good conversation about, you know, what are things that we need to do to make a more fair and equitable society? And I, I talked a little earlier, like, like mental health and substance abuse, those are health issues, you know, those are health crisis issues that, that we're saddling police departments to deal with, and they're ill-equipped to do it, you know, but I think if we just copycat stuff and don't, like, have some real uh, intellects and some real groundbreakers, like, like, start keep continuing to move the ball forward and make things better, you know, just like music, I mean, you, you know, you guys are, if you play the same thing over and over again, you get what you've always gotten, you know, but if you mm, have people yep. People who can think differently, be creative, um, and back it up with re. So here's the thing: backing it up with research and and, and statistics, improving. So there's an organization in New York out of John Jay College called Center for Policing Equity, and they measure stuff. And they're like, we are going to statistically figure out what the problem is, and we're going to come up with ways to, to solve it, and we're going to measure it, and we're going to prove it. And if it works, we're going to do it again, and then we're going to measure it, and we're going to make it better. And I think that that is woefully missing in, in my profession or this profession, the profession I no longer partake in. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I just don't think – if you're going to invest, invest there. Um you know, but stop throwing money at like SWAT trucks and stuff. Like, give that money to like healthcare providers. You know, and 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 fund fund people who are reaching out into those communities that are so underserved and help them. You know, deal with the health crises that they're having. You know, fund that absolutely. Fund that. You know, and and at the end of the day. You know, you might not need to pay as much money for police because you've gotten rid of half the problems that are there anyways. Mm -hmm. you know, defund the police doesn't sound great because if you're worried about being burglarized or raped, you, you really don't want, you know, half the amount of protection out there, you know. But so so it's really how you frame the problem and talk about it. Well, such complex issues and um, your insight is unlike any other I've heard, John. So thank you. Um, I man, dude, you know how much I love you, man. And I, I, I really wish, uh, you know, there were more more people out, out there thinking the way you just like you, man. It, it'd be well, thanks. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there, man. You know, so. I, I work in these circles because I feel like, you know, it's my job, if not anybody's to do something about it. And and I think that if more people had the courage to speak up, you know, that we would find that there's a lot of quiet voices out there that need to be heard. So I well, like you, Al. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel the same way. Uh, I really appreciate your insight. And yeah. Thanks, Kunj. Yeah. And Dave, thank you. It was great. It was great to talk with you. It's great to be here. Thanks for letting me be in the spotlight. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Our pleasure. Yeah, we have a little we have a little break from the spotlight right now as musicians. So we're That's happy. Right. To I know, I know your industry is taking a beating. <laughs> well, that's why we're using our time for for other good things. So thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Later. All right, we are here with Fazl Salahuddin, who is a uh, ACLU board member, as well as a uh, very accomplished lawyer, uh, Reuters super lawyer list he has made several times, uh, as well as criminal defense attorney and a civil rights litigator. Fazl, thank you so, so much for joining us here. We really appreciate it. Dave, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, especially with the other guests that you have. Um, I'm the one who's just very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. And I understand you are actually uh, one of two guests uh, that we've spoken to today who, in addition to a career in law, you also come from a background of playing music. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, up until age 28, I'm 44 now. So up until I was 28, I was, uh, I think, a dedicated percussionist. I've been to Guinea, West Africa, maybe eight or nine times. I had an apartment there that I kept for about five years running a West African drum and dance company. Um, and then around age 28, one becomes a little more woke. And I started to learn about um, cultural appropriation. And honestly, it became an ill-fitting hat to be a Pakistani American running a West African drum and dance company. And at the same time, uh, I became more aware of the abuse that my friends who were mostly black were suffering in New York City um, at the hands of the police. And I was being asked all the time, oh, can you help? Can't you help? And I really couldn't. Uh, all I knew was arts, arts management, 
and grant writing. And so some of that all came together to form the, the impetus for the transition around 2004, 2005. Since 2005, I've been dedicated to dedicating my life to helping poor people who are being abused by the system, in particular, the police, um, prosecutors, the FBI. Uh, for the most part, I've been doing work fighting the police, constitutional law specifically focused on civil rights, helping people protect themselves. And one thing um, that a lot of people know intuitively, but maybe it's not on the conscious uh, level, is that doing work in the justice system is a is a after the fact thing. You know, when I get involved, the police have already done what they've done. It's like, okay, here's what happened. What can we do to fix the scenario? But with federal litigation, we get to take it one step further, which is to say, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Unfortunately, we have not succeeded. Mm -hmm. CEG, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Elijah McCain, and many, many, many others. Um, but that's predominantly what I've been doing for the last, um, good Lord, 15 years. And you're a criminal defense lawyer on the board of directors for the ACLU as well, right? That's right, Mr. Shah. Are, are they directing you to different um, different events that have happened, or different you know cases that are you know that have already passed, and you're trying to appeal them? And what what what's the process there? Right. So, um, as a board member of the ACLU, I'm primarily concerned with governance, but. Um, as a ACLU affiliate attorney, which is what I do as well, the ACLU will come to me and say, we've got a racial, this is actually currently happening right now, we've got a racial profiling case, we filed a lawsuit against the police, will you lead this litigation? And so um, there have been times as a criminal defense lawyer where the ACLU has asked me to defend some folks who were caught up in the criminal justice system unfairly, and my law firm has a couple of criminal defense cases we're doing for them. For example, in Fort Collins, y'all might remember the police were passing these bans or the, the, the local city council was passing ordinances uh, attacking homeless people. And one way that was being enforced is certain people who were pulling over and say sleeping in their cars were being left alone and other folks who were not uh, who were doing the same thing, were not being left alone. And so we have some litigation against um, in Fort Collins on behalf of the ACLU. We also um, worked on the park ordinance case in Denver where um, the police, again, where they were trying to criminalize homelessness and the police were kicking out folks on their, they were adjudicating themselves, the police officers, whether or not you had been in the park in a previous time and then just deciding without judicial intervention. Yes, I deem you to have been here illegally once before, you are now banned for life. So that's kind of the work. Uh, it really is the intersection of criminal law and civil rights law, which I believe is human rights law. One of the most meaningful changes that I have seen this year has been what I believe is America waking up to, and I don't need to tell you, all but most of America seems to have acted like we didn't have a police brutality problem or a prosecutorial uh, pr a problem with our prosecutors. And it feels like in 2020, things that we all knew for the for as long as we've been grown ups. Now I'm getting phone calls. Oh, man. Yes, I guess I, the police are out of control. <laughs> it's like, where have you been? But uh, I'm grateful for that wokeness and that awakening because uh, otherwise, I mean, this is a life and death battle. I mean, by the way, the, the struggle against the police, it's a life and death battle. I have friends who are literally afraid for their own lives when they interact with, with police officers. So, you know, so I, I have a, a, a question for you. In the very little I try to spend on social media, every once in a while, you'll see, and we've all seen posts like this, you'll see some posts of some brother who's getting pulled over or stopped on the side of the road and who he knows his rights and is very vocal about those rights. 
And luckily, the, the thing the, the videos that I've seen have honestly worked out in their favor. You know, cops usually just, yo, all right, we're backing off. Okay, let, let's, ch let's chill this situation out. And, and, and that always amazes me. See someone who, uh, when you talk about knowledge is power, I'm not saying like that, maybe that doesn't work out for everybody. I don't know. But I'm just curious, how does one, and, and I'm asking for myself as well, but how does one even begin that journey of uh, learning what learning what to do in those kind of situations, knowing their rights, I, I, you know, other than like, man, I didn't do anything, I, you know, like, and, and you're just kind of at the mercy of a, a police officer or police officers. Like, what can just a, a normal person, normal citizen do? How, how can they start? Like, I, I'm just curious. Sure. Um, I think the first part of your question, which is where can where can we go to learn how to interact properly in police civilian encounters? And I would say the ACLU, the national ACLU, as well as your state affiliate. So ACLU of New York, ACLU California, ACLU of Colorado will have and I know our affiliate does has information on their website in terms of know your rights and in fact that's the tab for the aclu of colorado know your rights you click on that and it, it will walk through scenarios um i also uh will reference the national lawyers guild nlg they are wonderful their website also will have some of the same information and they do great know your rights trainings black lives matter as well blm they have really good information. But for right now, I would tell you, um, you know, uh, the first thing is to be able to ascertain when you're in a police civilian encounter is if you're free to go or not. Mm -hmm. And I will just say, if the answer is yes, you are free to go. 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 <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. because, it, because there's a consequence. If you don't go, the consequence is your encounter is now a consensual encounter. Mm. And consensual encounters are not what the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution uh, governs. It governs police seizures, but you are not seized if you're free to go and you're like, well, I'm just going to chit chat today with, you know, Joe Popo. Uh, no. First thing is figure out if you're free to go. And in the context of, say, well, in fact, I'm doing a case right now for the ACLU, a racial profiling case where my client was doing nothing wrong, was walking to his apartment and the police stopped him, demanded his ID. And so and that young man knew exactly what to do. It was brilliant. He said, why am I being detained? Am I free to go? No, you're not free to go. The police said and they demanded his ID. And at that point, they didn't have a reasonable basis to demand identification. So our client, rightfully, he had his camera on, just like uh, Mr. Evans was referencing the smart people that, that do record these things. And he said, I'm not giving you my permission to search me or take my ID, but I'm not gonna fight you either, right? I mean, oh, that's a big, big part of it. I've read some cases, uh, those, these are blood draw cases where the police believed somebody was under the influence and the suspect didn't wanna consent. The best thing you can do to protect your rights later in court, if that's where this goes, which frankly, if you're calling me for the most part, you're in trouble, right? Something happened, you've been charged or you've been beaten up or, but our client said, um, you don't have my permission, you don't have my consent, but I'm not going to fight you. So that kept the, the temperature of the interaction way down. Police understood, all right, this guy isn't being threatening, but he's not acquiescing or cooperating. So they, the police still had something to complain about, of course, because unless you obey like a, you know, like somebody without free will or an independent opinion, police are going to find you objectionable. That's right. the nature of police and fascist, fascistic psychology. Mm -hmm. But um, so first determine if you're free to go. Am I free to go? If you're in a, uh, if you've been pulled over and you're the one driving, 
most of us have enough common sense to know, no, you're not usually free to go until you provide some, your ID, insurance, registration. Um, all of that presumes, you know, the police are contacting you legally. The best thing you can do, am I free to go? And when they say no, you can voice your objection and your lack of consent, but just, I want people to be safe in their in encounters with police. I want them going home to their families. So it is very important to me that people understand you can protect yourself and keep the temperature down. Right. That's easy to say sitting in a, in a suit in my house because when you're in the situation and I have been cuffed by the police wrongfully and I didn't sound like this. It sounded more like, you know, because yeah. I was angry. Emotions were um, elevated. They get the better of you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but that's really it. I mean, uh, those are the three resources, ACLU, BLM, NLG, National Lawyers Guild, will have great resources. First thing, though, is always figure out, can I go or not? If the answer is yes, get on with your bad self, right? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Well, do you think that, you know, a lot of people talk about there being two different criminal justice systems, you know, and a lot of people accept that idea and a lot of people don't accept that idea. And I feel like it's a very real thing that's happening, but I feel like some people don't really hear the day-to-day -day examples, you know, of the clear racial bias. Do you have any examples of, you know, different um, things that you've encountered um, professionally that shows that there isn't, you know, a real disparity between, you know, people of color and, you know, white America? That's a great question. It's an insightful question. And you're right. There are people who are out there denying the disparity in, if not intent, in impact for people of color. You know, so the way I'll answer that is it's a complicated question. Are there two systems? Because everybody, no matter what side you're on, only sees one system. It's the justice system, whether you're in state court, municipal court, or federal court. It's still one system and there don't appear to be different rules. You know, the Colorado rules of criminal procedure or civil procedure are colorblind. The federal rules are colorblind. The statutes, which statutes are the laws that govern conduct are also colorblind. They're race neutral. So the folks who say, well, there's not two systems. These are the types of things they point to. We, but it's the choices that are made that show the discriminatory effect. And I think intent. So to answer the question, one has to understand all prosecution, all 100% of prosecutions are a political choice. The choice to punish crack cocaine in the federal system, which was a problem, far more severely than punishing the possession of cocaine, that's a political choice. Mm. White people do cocaine, black people do crack cocaine. So the choice to punish one more harshly was a political choice. That's one that has now at least gotten enough attention um, that that's changed. Do you find that sometimes the uh, public prosecutors, you know, and I've been in situations where I've kind of seen it happen in courtrooms where almost everyone takes the plea deal that's given to them, you know, by the you know public prosecutor, uh, uh, public defender, and the the judge, and is it? what's best for the client always, or, you know, is it because the fight is sometimes going to be too much to take on in general? You know, I know your, your, your uh, duties to the client and not to society, but the client probably still ends up with something on their record or, you know, ends up in the system, you know? And, and I, I've, I remember being in a courtroom and just seeing everybody taking deals and everyone that I spoke to before that, had said that they had either not done it or explained to me the situation of how they got there. And they all took probably the worst possible plea deals. And I remember, you know, I had pled not guilty and I had fought it, but it took, 
a lot and it took a lot, many years and money. And it was, you know, for something that was a, a, a felony for a, a gram of marijuana in Arizona, you know? So it's, it, you see, when you see it happen in real life, it's just, you wonder if it's the system itself is just broken even within the courts. Well, yes, the predominant way that plays out is with the way bail and bond works. I would see when, and I was lucky to be able to start my career as a public defender in the state of Colorado. It's the best public defender system in the country. Dedicated, dedicated, smart, passionate, hardworking, and tireless advocates. No matter how much work those public defenders had, as far as my experience was, is that they were always ready, willing, and able to bring that fight. Um, but to what you're talking about, the system harms the folks caught up in it. There's no question. And one of the ways that surfaces is, is in coerced plea deals. That coercion, by the way, all of us would understand coercion, but this, the justice system has its own very specific definition of coercion, which then, so it's only coercion if there's practically a gun to your head. Mm. What And where I have seen what you just described, um, Mr. Shah, play out is in situations where someone is arrested, say, um, on Friday, they, they've been in jail all weekend, they need to get to work. And, and this is actually a, an easy example. They need to get to work. And I'm saying, well, your bail is $10,000. You need a thousand, a little more than a thousand to get out. And if you don't, you're going to have to sit here until your trial. Or the prosecutor is offering you plead guilty today, get on probation, and guess what, Mr. Defendant, you go home today. Mm -hmm. A lot of my, yeah, and you know, to whom is that not coercion? That's total coercion. Basically, I don't want to plead guilty. I'm innocent, but I can't bail out, and I got to get back to work. So folks do plead guilty. That is coercion. And so you got to reform bail. I mean, you cannot reform a justice system without eradicating money bail. Um, and again, speaking of, of money and, you know, this this implies certainly a high level of uh, collusion to use a hot button word from the last uh, four years or so. Uh, but do you think that there's incentive from, you know, we know that there's privatized for profit prisons now that have very lucrative businesses that they're getting on nearly free labor for. Uh, and I think. You know, I wonder, have you seen evidence of or do you think that that informs the way that the uh, criminal justice system works in the actual courtrooms? And then beyond that, how police are told to act on the streets? Is it like this three part sort of connected string of things that are all under some grand direction? Or do you think they each have their own isolated issues that somehow feed the same problem? Really insightful question. I don't believe that there's a connected sort of conspiracy being directed by, that's just not possible. There's too many people involved and they don't stay involved forever. So too many moving parts for there to be that level of cooperation and collusion, not to mention how would that, inf how would the direction be communicated without discovery? No, I don't believe that is what we're talking about. What we're instead talking about is, is autonomous components of government operating um, in harmony to some extent to protect each other. Police are protected by the courts because you hear it. Judges say things like, well, I don't believe we have a system of policing where they're going around and, and, and arresting everybody who didn't do anything wrong that judges believe that. And so it's hard to combat people who have a presumptive, who have presumptive faith in police, right? And so police then act, or judges then act to protect themselves. I mean, it's, it's basically institutional players acting to protect themselves and the institutions that protect them. I will say things are getting better in Colorado. We passed a police accountability bill last summer that I believe should be an example for the rest of the country. I believe we were probably the first to do that. 
Um, we removed a particular type of immunity from police. So police could kill you and be like, well, I didn't know killing that dude in that way was going to be illegal. Now, right. remember from your own common sense, ignorance of the law is not a defense. You remember that? But it is a defense for police officers. Literally, they get to say in federal court, I didn't know that was illegal. And up until, you know, up until this summer in Colorado, and it's still the law in federal court, federal judges would say whether that was objectively reasonable or not. And if it was objectively reasonable that the cop didn't know the law, which is, is bizarre, then they get a pass. So ignorance of the law is no defense unless you're a cop. The way we're going to solve these problems are, one, uh, supporting our community leaders. So, um, you know, Black Lives Matter is already out there. The ACLU is already out there. National Lawyer Guild, already out there. What is harmful is when 100 other people say, well, I'm going to start 100 other organizations and dilute this, dilute the power of the people. I mean, I fully recognize not being a joiner. I have that gene in me. But um, joining groups that are already in the fight and have relationships. So with the ACLU, by joining the ACLU, for example, you're funding and supporting our ED, the executive director, meeting with the mayor, the chief of police, going to the town of Aurora. So, and that's partially how we got police accountability in Colorado. So when I see ACLU victories, I think, well, what is the outcome for the people of Colorado? And the outcome has been increased accountability, better jails. Um, of course, you've heard me brag about our public defender system. Um, that's not necessarily connected to the strength of our ACLU affiliate, but uh, I don't think it's wholly unrelated, which is a concern for civil rights and human rights for the Coloradans, which is what our primary focus is. Um, but I wanted to say that I think it's important that folks support local organizations doing this work, $10, $5, $10, $15, whatever, rather than starting splinter organizations, which does happen when things like summers, like what we're having right now, which I think is a new civil rights movement. Um, it can be easy to say, well, I'll start my own organization. Sure, but it's probably better for you to join someone else's because they've already got the relationships. They've already got the conversations they're already working on legislation. You, Man, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I just had this conversation with a, a really good friend of mine, and we were talking about, we were trying not to go down a negative road, but we're saying how uh, we have friends all over the country who are protesting and, and, and seemingly doing the right thing. But what I, what I noticed is like, man, it almost got, it's almost gotten to a point this summer, especially, that there's all, like you said, all like these little organizations popping them. Everybody's trying to do the right thing, but there's no real leadership, I guess. You know, like, and the, again, there are organizations out there that have been around for a long time. And sometimes I've, I feel that that's kind of the problem in a way. Like people just say, oh, that's just old school. I'm, I'm going to jump on this new thing. Right when, down. in fact, they should be, like, aligning with, you know, these people who have been around the block many times. But I said, man, you know, it's so funny. Look at this, man. Like, all there's these all these organizations, all these people protesting and no and but the right wing, man, they they're united. You know, what I mean, like, it, it's, that's what it looks like. You know, I was like, man. And I, I was just saying, I really wish people uh, were on the left really trying to fight the good fight would actually that's what I think that's the one thing that I've noticed. Everyone's talking about the civil rights uh, uh, movement of the sixties and that's, and, and, and comparing and making comparisons. That's the one difference for me is just a, a lack of real unity. I'm, I'm glad people are out there. It's beautiful to see people out, you know, like making their voices heard, but that's the the one thing, man, and I'm gl I'm glad you you mentioned that. You know, it's like we there there are organizations who have been around for a long time who know how to fight this, you know, and who know the fight, and 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 uh, so it it would be really great if everyone watching, if they're thinking or if they're already out like out there doing it, it's, it's beautiful. But there's there's nothing wrong with like getting up with uh, with people who really know what they're doing, you know. 
like we you know so anyway i'm I'm really glad you mentioned that man because that that's uh that's been something that's been uh i've been uh struggling with you know so i appreciate that well uh, uh, yeah of course that is a struggle it, it's something that i'm a, i was a bernie supporter um mm-hmm. maybe some of you were too um yeah. and joe biden is not bernie sanders by a long shot but you know what Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump, and those are my choices. So yeah. a lot of folks forget that we don't live in a world where you're going to get the perfect candidate. That's just not the world we live in. I don't know that world. I've never seen that world, and I don't believe that world exists. And Voltaire had a quote that I find useful in a lot of scenarios, which is, do not let perfection be the enemy of good. Yeah. And sometimes you can have something that's good and folks are like, well, it's not perfect. So fuck that, you know? And I've had friends even who are like, yeah, you know what? Let's just burn it all down. Let Trump win and burn it up. But people are going to die. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. easy to say that if you don't have all that much on the line, I find a lot of people whose lives didn't change that much from, you know, Obama to Trump, it, they're at the forefront, um, splintering the left in half, and they don't really have that much online, or so they think. I mean, who knows what another four years of this might look like, not to get too partisan here, because we're trying to discuss general issues and facts, but, right, right, right. but yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a little bit of a generational thing, too, where, and I was a little bit guilty of it last time with the Bernie thing, feeling like he got he got burned. And, uh, you know, this, this animosity that made me almost, of course I went out and I voted for Hillary, but I almost thought about it. People did it. Yeah. Right. I thought about not doing it. And I think we are used to immediate gratification. We're used to getting everything we want. It's all at our fingertips. We've got our phone. We got social media. We're not used to the idea of settling for anything as a generation. I am super guilty of this as well. So that, I think that's part of it too. People don't understand. Like this has always been the way it's been. You have unfortunately a binary choice and maybe one day that'll change, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I mean, voting is not a marriage. You're not married to this candidate. It's just a, you know, like it's a, it's like a bus ride. You take the bus to where this guy's going to take you. You you take, you stop at that stop and then you find the next candidate that's going to take you even closer to where you're trying to go. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I like that. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Again, with all of these, I feel like we could we could go on forever. So much to ask you, and maybe we'll do it again. But this has been really informative. I think we covered some really really good points. Um, so, Fazil, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Great to see you all on here. Great to meet you. And uh, again, it's just I've been fanboying uh, for the last few days uh, in preparation for this. So, thanks again. <laughs> Appreciate uh, it. Same here. All Same right. Here. Have a great day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you too, man. Later. On. Bye. And now it's time for some music. She had no 
That's all, folks. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in, and remember to keep your mind in tune. 